Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. This is a quote. A walk through an ancient redwood grove remains a moving, even life-changing journey. It's not just the size of the extraordinary trees, but their collectivity and dominance, the awe of the wayfarer. It's the absolute, even mystical quiet of place, under which an impossibly high canopy extinguishes sky and presents a prehistoric remnant of a twilight millions of years old. The breath and history of the great forest are palpable tidings from another dimension. That's from a book called The Ghost Forest, Racist, Radicals, and Real Estate in the California Redwoods. It is written by our guest today, Greg King. Greg King is a longtime forest activist who is credited with spearheading the movement to protect the Headwaters Forest in Humboldt County in California. Greg King is also an award-winning journalist. Greg King, it is my very good pleasure, sir, to welcome you to this radio program. Uh, it's great to be on, Mitch. Thank you. And we're going to be talking about the history of California's Redwood Forest. I want to quote you just one more time from your book. Uh, you write this, Redwoods began evolving 200 million years ago at the beginning of the early Jurassic period, arriving just after the dinosaurs. They survived the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea and continental drift, and they managed to withstand, escape, and evolve with raging climatological shifts 66 million years ago when the Chicxulub Chicxulub meteor wiped out the dinosaurs and 75% of all life on Earth. Redwoods prevailed and then thrived to withstand ongoing reorganizations of climate. Redwoods migrated. Gray King, tell me more about this history, uh, natural history of the Redwood Forest in California. Uh, well, that um, migration you just described to me is one of the most extraordinary elements of the Redwood story, that it could survive such massive shifts, even when 90 percent you know, of the other species were wiped out on the planet, uh, you know, more than 60 million years ago. And uh, they ha are such a hardy tree. And yet we see them having landed now in California, you know, what is now California. Uh, you know, in a two million acre band, really dependent on fog. And so we can kind of look back millions of years and see a very wet planet. And I, that is why redwoods are found in, on all of the uh, continents or redwood remnants, the fossils uh, in the northern hemisphere today, um, because it was such a wet planet. So we see redwoods as, you know, being incredibly hardy and, of course, huge and ancient. And yet, in a way, very fragile, uh, that they require this moisture. Uh, so it's really phenomenal when you hike around uh, on the edge of the redwood biome, as it's called, and you can see uh, when you get to the edge of the redwood, sometimes in the hills, and then look down and there's the edge of the fog. The fog has stopped and there are the tops of the redwoods poking out. And that's the last redwoods to the east. Uh, it's a really wonderful phenomenon and, and one of the great attributes of the redwoods toward its survivability. I don't know if it's the correct term, but that's how they drink, right? I mean, that's how they get a lot of their water is through fog. Yes, um, through absorbing fog, about 30 uh, percent, up to 50 percent in some places near the coast. Uh, it's a phenomenal uh, um, contribution to these enormous trees that require so much water uh, that, you know, they can get it, you know, through the fog and not just all through their roots. And that probably explains why they can thrive in California, which we go through our major droughts, but especially along the coast, we always have fog almost all, all year round. Yes, the fog is diminishing. There's like a lot of changes in the world right now. Uh, we see the fog uh, diminishing and there are a couple of studies that demonstrate that. And anecdotally, I can tell you, you know, living my entire life in the Redwood Range, that I have seen fog diminish significantly, especially here in Humboldt County. Uh, today, I mean, the last few weeks with this very low pressure where it's been foggy throughout the Northwest uh, state have been kind of like the old days. Uh, but today where it's very clear uh, in June, kind of unusual up here in Humboldt County on the coast, uh, that has been more emblematic of the change. That's very interesting to me. I think we all, regardless of where we live, have noticed changes in weather. Now, I'm, I'm a city guy, and I think that will become very clear in the course of our conversation to you. Uh, but, but, but tell me more about just what you have anecdotally experienced in, in changing climate in the Redwood Forest. Yeah, you know, growing up, I grew up in Guerneville on the Russian River in Sonoma County, and we were about 10 air miles from the coast. And every morning, 
in in summer almost every morning and then into fall it diminished naturally but uh, there would be this fog bank come in and the fog would burn off there at about between 9 and 10 a.m almost like clockwork um uh, my father passed away in 2016 in the same house I was born in, in 1961. Uh, and, you know, I, we spent a lot of time there over the last year and a half of his life. And and I did anyway. I've always gone back down from Humboldt County to Sonoma County uh, to visit and spend time. But it did strike me how that early morning summer fog was not as frequent as when I grew up there. And you could see it. And you can see it also in, say, Armstrong Woods, which is a very, very small remnant ancient redwood grove in Guerneville, where I grew up playing there quite a bit. And it's a little drier, a little more fragile, it seems. There was one year, a few years back, I can't remember. It was around uh, 2016, but I can't remember the exact year, when there was virtually no rain until January. Uh, and that, you know, is not it's not a fog story, but it is a climate story. And it it was really disturbing. And you, this dryness in, and I remember walking at the beginning of January and this dryness. And you get that now in summer when it should be very moist due to the fog and it's not nearly as much. Greg King, you, you begin your book again with this natural history, which we're chatting about right now, and then move into the 1850s and sort of give a history of the last, I don't know, 170 years or so, or the battle over the Redwood Cities against logging and mining and, and, and all of these things, and even colonialism. Uh, but, but talk to me about what's important to know about the Redwood Forest of California before 1850. Oh, that it was inviolable. Uh, the redwoods um, of California prior to, uh, you know, European settlement uh, stood as almost a single band with a couple of breaks, um, but almost a single band that uh, very few human beings, including the native peoples who surrounded the redwoods, they never lived inside the redwood groves or very little, uh, but that even some of these reaches were so extreme uh, to get to uh, far into the redwoods, you know, moving maybe uh, one mile every four or five hours, that there were very little explored even by native peoples. They did do it, um, but you had to carry enough food. There's no food in the redwoods for a human being, uh, plenty of water. Uh, but uh, this kind of uh, ecosystem uh, from no more than 30 miles inland, uh, but about 450 miles long uh, of stupendous trees um, that changed everything where they grew. Uh, it was a completely different ecosystem than anywhere else. Uh, well, to the west is ocean, but and then to the east would be mixed hardwood and Douglas fir and other um, conifer species, great grasslands, things like that, and a wide variety of wildlife. But in the redwoods, everything changed wildlife like humans could not survive inside the redwoods uh, except for some old growth dependent species uh, right now we're looking at um, the humboldt martin which is extremely rare and ex exists in only two places today in california uh, and um, species like that and the fisher and of course salmon are an old growth dependent species and the spotted owl and the marbled merlet these species all thrived in the ancient redwoods but it's nothing like what we think about, you know, in, in the wild California with the grizzly bears and the the wolves and the, uh, you know, the elk. Elk will be found in redwoods today, um, but they also didn't get around much. It was almost impossible. So that it was just this massive change in habitat characteristics suddenly and inexorably uh, could not be. Uh, inhabited by many, many of the species that surrounded the redwoods in this impenetrable band, you know, from north to south. What what made it so difficult to survive for, for so many species? There just wasn't the food. Um, redwoods are dominant. And so the plant life uh, is very particular to redwoods, the ferns and the oxalis, uh, the salal, uh, species like that, um, that did not provide um, a lot of food, um, say the grass seeds. Um, there was the salmon, but the salmon were easily reachable outside of the redwoods and then uh, nearer the coast as well. Um, 
and uh you know small game rabbits you didn't get many rabbits in the you know or, or uh, hares in the redwoods um you really uh it, it was a plant dominant world and the plants being the redwoods up to 400 feet tall in places uh and growing in massive clusters that disallowed growth of much of anything else it diminished diversity but on a stupendous scale and and so there just wasn't the food for most of the species that we think about that need the food uh you know that surround the redwood forest is it that just the sun couldn't penetrate the canopy that was created that's exactly it right there was not the light that is needed for this diversity of plants that you know there's no acorns in the redwoods uh things like that so um yes it's just completely dominant and unusual in the world uh there's nothing else like uh, the redwood forest in that respect. Do we not find, uh, you said earlier that we have remnants, historical fossils, I guess, of redwood forests around the world. Do we do we not have any other redwood forests outside of California today? No, the coast redwood is the only place in California, you know, again, from a little over the Oregon border into Oregon, not much, uh, about 10 miles, and then uh, south to Big Sur. Uh, that is the extent of the range. There's the cousin, the giant sequoia in the Sierra, which grows uh, in even smaller um, uh, groves there, small habitat islands. And then another cousin, which was once thought extinct, and I mentioned this in, in the ghost forest, is the dawn redwood in uh, Sichuan, China, uh, that was rediscovered in the 1950s. Uh, so those are the the three uh, Calif- those are the three redwood cousins, if you will. Um, but there is only this one place where coast redwood grows naturally. You were mentioning that the the redwood forests of California stretch from north to south along the coast about 400 miles long, or, or did at one point. Maybe, maybe you'll, you'll explain to me what it's like now, but you also write that only 4% of the original redwood forest before 1850 still exists. That's right, about 80,000 acres. Uh, the rest was logged off. Uh, growing in second growth after that, which was also mostly logged off and is still being logged off, uh, primarily by two companies that own uh, just about half of the two million acre ancient redwood biome or, or redwood biome. It's not ancient anymore. Um, but yes, about uh, 4% left uh, contained mostly in groves in Humboldt and Del Norte County uh, counties. And uh, there's uh, Redwood National Park, Prairie Creek, Del Norte Redwood State Park, Jedediah Smith, Headwaters Forest and Humboldt Redwood State Park uh, in Humboldt and Del Norte counties. Um, there's virtually no ancient redwood in Mendocino County, just a few hundred acres. And it used to uh, hold more acreage uh, than any other of the counties, 640,000 acres of ancient redwood in uh, Mendocino County growing in a contiguous band, uh, impenetrable, the widest and the longest band uh, of all the redwoods in terms of counties and it's virtually all gone. Sonoma County has three tiny remnant ancient redwood groves. It's virtually all gone. There was once 150, 180,000 acres of ancient redwood there. And then you get down to Santa Cruz County. Um, you can skip Marin, Marin County. It was all logged off there. There's uh, some uh, second growth redwood in Marin County. Uh, then you get Big Basin, about 1,500 acres. And there's a couple other small remnant ancient redwood groves in Santa Cruz County. And that's it. Uh, 4%, just a tiny, tiny remnant, and extremely fragile and vulnerable. And uh, there are many, many issues facing the parks right now, this 80,000 acres uh, that are crucial to the survival of many species in California. And we can get into that later if you want. Um, but uh, well, the, tell me the now. parks. Yeah, yeah, tell me. Well, the parks themselves need to be protected. Uh, I'm sort of on a crusade right now to uh, get four roads closed in the northern parks, uh, two of them in Jedediah Smith Redwood State Park and two of them in Prairie Creek Redwood State Park that are superfluous, that do not um, provide for uh, highway transportation, uh, which but which only allow for people to view the redwoods from their cars. Uh, two of the roads in particular are uh, destructive in their uh, bisecting of these two groves. And uh, so Newton B. Drury uh, Scenic Parkway, which goes through the middle of Prairie Creek Redwood State Park, uh, 
it is really a destructive artery. In fact, a it was so bad. It used to be the Highway 101, but it was so bad that in the late 80s, early 90s, a bypass was built around Prairie Creek in order to get the cars out of the park. Yet the original road was never closed. And now people are parking all over the place and walking willy nilly through the forest. Um, jutting off from that is a dirt road called Cow Barrel Road that cuts up into the hills in the middle of the ancient redwoods that serves no purpose whatsoever. And it spews uh, dust everywhere through the forest. So the noise and dust are uh, epidemic in the summer in Prairie Creek. People come from all over the world to see these redwoods. And one of the most ironic and telling um, manifestations of this was uh, when I was walking around on one of the trails near the road, which I don't do very often, uh, but there is a large cone with a sign and it instructs uh, visitors to put their ears up to the cone and it will block the highway noise so you can hear the quiet of the forest. And uh, I thought that was absurd. So <laughs> the um, state parks department is a reticent to even talk about closing of these roads. What, why why uh, are the roads detrimental to the to the forest, though? What what is it about? I mean, sound. You said sound and, and dust. Yes. Um, well, for one thing, when you think of the redwoods, uh, people generally think of the giant trees and the omnipotence of that ecosystem and the grandeur. The cathedral is the almost cliche now the description, uh, but <laughs> the quiet of the redwood forest is unlike any other quiet in the world, I would argue, and is one of two principal components of the ancient redwood experience. There's the massive trees that create this um, enveloping effect in all ways and accompanied by and creating this um, magisterial quietude that is both, uh, you know, is absolutely ruined by the roads. Uh, barring that, in terms of habitat, uh, the roads are noisy. They're a, a robust intrusion into a very fragile world inhabited by species that are almost gone. Uh, and um, so there's there's no real reason to have these roads and every reason not to. Uh, and it can be done to accommodate tourists. Um there can be, you know, one of the arguments that the Park Service uses is, well, we want disabled people to be able to use these parks as well, which, of course, I would completely agree with. And yet, if you close these roads, A, you end up with uh, one of the world's finest uh, wheelchair routes. Um, B, you can establish a permit system, which the parks have in other places, Tall Trees Grove. In Redwood National Park has a permit system. And if you have a disabled license plate, you are maybe one of 20 uh, to uh, be able to access with your car on this road, which would, you know, diminish by about 99% the car travel in the parks. Um, there could also be a shuttle service that would pass through the grove once every hour or so, electric shuttle, quiet, clean. Um, so there are many alternatives. Um, there is just an intransigence to change that I find at the state parks in particular. No. Uh, and, you know, you can't even drive into Denali in Alaska. It's, you know, it, the park service there understands the fragility. And yet these groves are, are uh, infinitesimally smaller uh, and and just uh, beleaguered. And and also the what happens with the roads, of course, is you get people... Uh, parking everywhere, in, uh, defecating, leaving toilet paper and trash and running through the woods willy nilly and through very delicate habitat. And we know human beings, we do this. And so you, you cut out the cars and you diminish that well into the 90th percentile as well. Yeah, yes, we do do those things. And, uh, and noise is important. I, we did a show maybe a year ago about animal perceptions and the importance of noise and how human noise pollution, machine noise pollution uh, has affected uh, their own world. So that matters. This is Letters and Politics. Again, we are in conversation with Greg King. Greg King is the author of the book, The Ghost Forest, Racist, Radicals, and Real Estate in the California Redwoods. Greg King is an award-winning journalist 
and activist. Again, he was, he has been credited with spearheading the movement to protect the Headwaters Forest in Humboldt County, California. We are in conversation about the history of the Redwood Forest of California. Greg King, let's get into this history and regrettably the, the destructive history and, and, and the history of people trying to save the forest. I mean, this is not a new phenomenon. This also goes back to the middle of the 19th century. But tell me what's important about the year 18, the 1850s and, and the decades to follow. Right. Uh, you know, the 1850s, uh, redwood logging wasn't much uh, of an issue. In the southern counties, it was. Uh, redwood was used, you know, um, the smaller trees in in part, you know, but they were so unwieldy and the technology really didn't exist much to deal with redwood. So, for instance, uh, up in Humboldt County, uh, Humboldt Bay area was settled in about 1850. But redwood logging didn't begin until 1854. Uh, prior to that, Douglas fir and, and pr principally spruce were logged because they weren't so unwieldy and large. Uh, we really see redwood logging taking off in the 1860s. Uh, commercial logging, uh, Guerneville, where I'm from, on the Russian River, uh, the first mill was established there in 1865. And the land was divvied up in the 1860s, uh, generally under the Homestead Act. And then um, it kept, you know, grew every decade um, exponentially, the redwood logging. And then by the 1880s, um, the redwood was recognized as a very important uh, wood product for industry. A lot of people think about redwood as a component of housing, which it always has been. And, and uh, my current house is all redwood built in the eight, 1950s. It's um, amazing the, the type of lumber it provides, which maybe is part of the problem. But you, you write that there are still redwood homes or buildings that are almost are that I think are like 200 years old. Yes, up at, at Fort Ross, um, the some of the original buildings and, and lumber that the Russians used to build Fort Ross in northern Sonoma County on the coast uh, are still there. And uh, so redwood, um, yes, has a longevity. Uh, that is unusual among woods due to a lack of resin uh, and a strength, uh, even though it's very light when milled and dried. Uh, and so these qualities uh, contributed to an understanding that redwood lumber could undergird industry better uh, in some ways than any other wood product. And so it, this was well recognized by the 1880s, which uh, there was um, resulted in massive land fraud. Uh, the 1878 Timber and Stone Act allowed uh, settlers to claim a 160-acre parcel of, of any tree forest in the western uh, three states. Um, and uh, that act was routinely abused. Most Timber and Stone Act uh, um, parcels of 160 acres were gathered up by what were called entrymen who then signed them over immediately to a middleman who sold them to corporate investors. And uh, the result of that in the Redwoods was one in one fell swoop, 124,000 acre theft from the public domain of some of the finest Redwood land that ever stood. Uh, if we fast forward uh, just one more decade, to the early 1890s, um, there was a family called Hooper, and this is well covered in the ghost forest. Uh, the Hoopers are the redwood timber barons you've never heard of, yet the most important family probably due to their innovation and the scope of their ownership uh, and their ability to broker lands. So two of the Hooper brothers, Charles and George, were involved in this redwood land scam in Humboldt County, as well as a Scottish syndicate and New York and Bay Area investors and locals up here who facilitated the theft. Um, in 1892, C.A. Hooper Company uh, established the uh, Excelsior Red uh, Excelsior Pipeline Company uh, because C.A. Hooper, who hired a Dutch uh, water engineer, understood that Redwood made the best material to um, make pipelines. And as soon as these in, at times massive redwood pipes snaking sometimes miles across terrain uh, interested investors and uh, industrialists they understood its unique ability to transform the west 
And so the industry's use of redwood is, is little understood. Um, I explain it as much as I can in the ghost forest, uh, yet integral to the growth of especially the West and especially these pipelines. So for instance, the uh, Arroyo de los Reyes in uh, Los, what is now downtown Los Angeles was once a, a great wetland and it was drained in 1894 with a redwood pipe. And then uh, the the communities that sprang up there were watered through redwood pipes and water was held in redwood tanks and sewage lines uh, were made out of redwood. They wouldn't breach. Um, the wood didn't rot. You didn't want your sewer line rotting. Nothing else worked like redwood. Uh, many uses like this, all the East Bay Water Company, uh, all these redwood pipes everywhere, uh, allowing the growth of the East Bay and allowing the growth of industry. But the most important use of these redwood pipes, these stave pipes, they were called because they were pieces of lumber that were specially milled and put together and banded with iron hoops uh, and again, stitched across miles of terrain. Uh, they were used to take water from dams in the Sierra Nevada and elsewhere around the country, but particularly in California and send that water for miles to turbines that powered the growth of the West starting in the late 18, the late 1890s. And the, the redwood stave pipe, I would argue more than any other invention, except for perhaps the railroads, um, allowed industry to grow, allowed the West to grow into the empire that we know today. And that without redwood, not only because of stave pipes, but many other products, uh, California would look differently today had it not been for the redwood products that supported that growth. I mean, it's just remarkable to think how much we have physically altered the state in less than 200 years. Even where I live, which is downtown Oakland, right next to Lake Merritt, which actually wasn't a lake. It was mudflats. Yeah. Um, the other day I was down on the, the, the estuary between Oakland and Alameda County by Jack London Square, and that wasn't an estuary. That was a peninsula. Uh, I, I mean, it's just shocking how much we have changed this. The, the California itself in less than 200 years. Yes, the plunder, um, if you will, has been phenomenal. Uh, and uh, even Karl Marx noted that in the 1880s, that California is particularly important, he said, uh, due to the rapidity of the exploitation of the resources and the growth and the power of, of the people who controlled them, uh, which I found fascinating that even Karl Marx was looking at California, right? I mean, <laughs> you don't you don't hear that very often. Um, but yes, the, the transformation uh, occurred extremely rapidly as a write in the ghost forest. Uh, you know, the despoilation of San Francisco Bay occurred in a single generation. Whereas the Ohlone and Pomo people lived in the Bay Area um, for thousands and thousands of years and harmed the ecosystem not at all. In fact, were able to, um, you know, maintain their food sources uh, and and you know ha create this abundance uh, that for themselves uh, that enriched the land. I would argue, uh, and then here came came the takers. You know, and there was nothing but taking and exploitation and, and power mongering and deep insecurities, I believe, in these people that they had to create these empires out of the very life of the planet that sustains us all. And we're seeing the results of that today. Um, a very rapid industrialization leads to uh, an almost inexorable uh, planetary demise. And I don't quite know where to go with this in, in my life or in my thinking or writing except to say that a it was all discernible in real time and b the current juggernaut uh toward completing this experiment uh seems to be well in place and uh it, there doesn't really seem to be much alteration of the dynamic whatsoever greg black you have spent a lifetime as a forest activist a redwood forest activist um I remember in, in, in the early 2000s, late 1990s, as a, as a very young reporter covering what was happening up north from the Bay Area in Humboldt County. I remember the bombing of, of, of Judy Berry and Daryl Cherney's car. I remember interviewing Julia Butterfly Hill, one of the first notable people I've ever know, inter, interviewed, so I'll always remember that uh, quite fondly. Before we get to the, this period of time, though, activism has been happening around the redwood forest for a long time 
there were people who were trying to push back against this at the time that we're talking about between sort of the 1850s and early 1900s? Yes, very much so. Um, you know, it, it, at the time the Timber and Stone Act was passed, the Interior Secretary Carl Schurz uh, was so concerned that he recommended immediately removing from the um, lands that could be claimed um, about 64,000 acres uh, of virgin redwood, you know, just to preserve it because he understood what was coming. Um, there were uh, preservation attempts uh, in the Big Basin area in particular because it was so close to the Bay Area. That began in the 1880s, resulting in 1902, the Big Basin, uh, California's first state park. Uh, and then in Sonoma County, uh, there was um, long term effort to save the tiny remnant Armstrong Woods that I grew up uh, playing in as a child. Uh, my grandmother and her family were involved in that effort when my grandmother was a teenager. In 1917, the county agreed to purchase the grove uh, due to public pressure. It was very well organized. There were uh, eight page inserts that were purchased and um, placed in newspapers all around the North State. Uh, and really the clash of this increasingly or well organized and funded um, citizenry uh, to protect redwoods in the early 20th century and industries understanding that the growth uh, of their empires was foundation the foundation of that was redwood lumber in large respects uh, resulted in this pseudo environmental group that you know, I have exposed in, in the ghost forest as a, a the first uh, creation of a organization dedicated to what we today call greenwashing. And that is Save the Redwoods League. And Save the Redwoods League was founded by and for major California industrialists to protect the redwood ecosystem from preservation. Yeah, when and, you say greenwashing, what we mean by that is just corporations who are usually doing the mining or the logging or whatever, or, you know, you see this with gas companies a lot, uh, acting like they're protecting the environment. Yes, there will be these organizations, um, say the, you know, I, I'm making this up, right? The I, I just off the top of my head, the Appalachian Preservation Society or whatever, and it's uh, backed by mansion and the coal industry or something like that, <laughs> right? I mean, just, you know, that's how it works. I mean, I'm sure I could come up with a better, more specific example. But since we're talking about Save the Redwoods League, you know, it's important um, and it's irrefutable. The evidence I found, it was just, I mean, here are these guys who own the biggest, not only industries, some in, in the world, but redwood timber operations, lumber companies, and businesses that rely on redwoods. And I don't want to give away too much. It's in the book, but uh, these individuals were 100% in that milieu. Uh, and so you understand when you get into this, as I did when I went to um, Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley and began researching through the 200,000 pages or so of, of uh, Save the Redwoods League archives, that that's who founded and ran the organization for decades. Uh, and the evidence is there. And I did not set out to, to determine this. I, during the 80s when we were in 90s, when we were trying to protect Headwaters Forest, I found the league uh, to be um, ineffectual and, you know, past its former glory of the 19. 30s and 20s. Um, and yet what I found was there was no former glory, um, that it was this great ruse that has worked b brilliantly. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, I got I found what I found and I couldn't believe it. Um, and I will I'm going to give away one particular smoking gun yeah, in this narrative, because it's very important for people to understand that uh, this is not conjecture at all that the 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 book wrote itself um one of the founding directors who wrote the league's bylaws and articles of incorporation was a young up-and-coming and very powerful attorney named wigington creed great pulp fiction name uh born uh in the uh central valley but raised in in uh berkeley and uh he was a protege of uh, darius ogden mills the uh, great uh 
um, gold miner, banker, and Wall Street uh, soothsayer. Uh, and he, Wigginson Creed came back from New York from Mills's office and went to work for water companies, he became president of East Bay Water, which was one of the greatest mm. consumers of Redwood Stay Pipes. Um, he also inherited a vast trove of companies from his father-in-law, Charles Appleton Hooper of the Hooper Redwood Dynasty. And so Wigington Creed um, was president of Redwood Manufacturers Company, the largest maker of stave pipes in the world, Redwood Stave Pipes. Uh, he was president of that when he became a founding director of Save the Redwoods League. And he was also president of PG&E, which owned Redwood Manufacturing Company. They bought it in 1910. Wigington Creed retained the presidency uh, and a, um, a vast uh, in investment. And PG&E, with its Redwood stave pipes uh, for power, was the world's largest consumer of those Redwood pipes uh, by a power company. And there are many, many other examples. Uh, Creed was... Um, president of invest excelsior investment company which brokered redwood lands he worked with his father-in-law before uh, ca hooper died in 1914 to buy and sell redwood timberlands he was a redwood timber baron and a redwood consumer a vast redwood consumer and he was a founding director of save the redwoods league and wrote the bylaws and articles and corporation and we can go on and on and on and i do in the book it's it's all very well documented. Um, and again, I got to these these findings and just put my pen down. And I couldn't believe it, what I was looking at, that there was no way these people were going to protect Redwood Forest. They were going to prevent it. And they did in many, many instances. And I, I detailed that in the Ghost Forest as well. They, 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 uh, this promise of we're going to do logging sustainably which i think you get from all kinds of industries including mining mining and extraction industries we're going to do this sustainably this isn't a new thing they say they, they've always said this don't worry it's just going to be a little bit and you know we'll, we'll do it in a way that's responsible well right the sustainable logging really wasn't a um, thing or a catchphrase back in the early 20th century it was um you know preservation of representative tracts of redwood. That's what we're gonna, how we're going to do this because clear cutting was the norm. Uh, you almost couldn't sustainably or um, selectively log uh, back in the early 20th century. It was almost, it was too difficult. Uh, so, and also, you know, there was just a maximization of labor and time uh, spent in the redwoods and the clear cut, you extract more value all at once. Um, that did become more of a thing after World War II uh, especially um, when the Redwood National Park struggle, the uh, efforts to preserve Redwood Creek uh, boiled up about or starting in 1960. And so what we saw in that um, respect early on was first Redwood companies putting signs up and, and placing ads that would say the Redwoods are saved right from all the in the redwood parks and which was kind of a fallacious argument at that point there were only about 40 to fifty thousand acres of redwood protected and about um almost three hundred thousand acres <clears throat> unprotected uh so they weren't really safe but and then you get into the sustainable forestry argument and really there's only there's very little sustainable logging going on in california today actual sustainable logging the best example of that occurs here in Arcata, uh, at the, in the Arcata Community Forest in Humboldt County. And it's done by the city of Arcata. They have an excellent master plan and they do very light touch redwood logging. They leave the biggest trees. They open up light appropriately. Uh, they take a very small number of, of high quality saw logs, get more money for them per board foot. Uh, and when they are done, I've taken people up there and, and I can see the difference, but it's not much. Uh, and it's a uh, very low 10% of a stand cut um, uh, over 20 to sometimes 50 years. Uh, and so, you know, I support that type of sustainable logging. There is no good sustainable logging anymore in ancient Redwood. You couldn't do it. And they're, they're all either locked up or gone in any case. But uh, there are two companies that own nearly half of the redwood biome the two million acre redwood biome 
and that's Green Diamond Resource Company. It used to be called Simpson, and they own 420,000 acres that surround the Redwood Parks of Humboldt and Del Norte counties. And they operate on a very heavy cut rotation and clear cut and spray herbicides and uh, plant uh, trees and rows, and it's a monoculture and it's virtually sterile. And these lands surround the parks. And it's extremely important that Green Diamond um, change its practices to support the parks. Right now, the parks are more threatened due to these practices. And then the other company is the Humboldt Redwood, Mendocino Redwood Company, owned by the San Francisco Fisher family. They own the Gap uh, and Banana Republic, et cetera. And they own um, about uh, half a million acres of Redwood in Humboldt and Mendocino counties. They bought up the carcass of the Pacific Lumber Company after Max Sam drove it into bankruptcy in 2007. Uh, the Fishers bought it up. And they cut um, heavier than one would like. It's not quite green diamond, um, but they're not responsive really to the needs of the ecosystem. And there are areas where they're logging and they're logging heavily in some of those areas that need to be left alone. And, you know, how do you tell a billionaire um, family that is maximizing its profits, you know, if, you know in the Redwoods that uh, they shouldn't be doing that. So, you know, at issue, in, as always, and this is the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, which has been in collusion with the timber industry uh, since its inception in 1973. And I detail that quite well in the book, I think. And still today. Uh, still today. Still today, I mean, to allow what's going on, especially in the Green Diamond patchwork clear cut land uh, is you have these violations of the California Environmental Quality Act that are very clear. Um, you know, at least to me, I'm not a lawyer. Um, this has not been litigated, um, but the company does have habitat conservation plans and sustainable um, uh, incidental take permits to be able to kill uh, endangered species because it's such a heavy cut. And so from my perspective, uh, again, this is not proven in court in any way. Um, Green Diamond uh, should be, but hasn't been litigated against uh, very much. Uh, you look at this um, collection of uh, clear cuts on lands that really need to be allowed to grow. And you um, see that there could very well be a violation of California Environmental Quality Act and its stipulation that um, all um future present and past logging operations be con considered for their cumulative impacts on the environment and i don't think there's any argument that there's a cumulative impact here um and yet the california department of forestry does not ever deny these plans um and so it's it's it was always been a difficult fight uh working through the state agencies the state regional water quality control board has been terrible up here um, state fish and wildlife has been better. Again, Department of Forestry has always been, uh, you know, it, it, it has tried a strong allegiance to the timber industry, um, blatantly so in the 80s and 90s, as I point out in the ghost forest. Um, but uh, so, you know, where to go with this? Is, there's, there's, really, there's nowhere left to go except the courts. And you can't, you have to sue on individual timber harvest plans instead of a collection. And um, so what's really needed is uh, a, uh, you know, action in Sacramento to to disallow this type of cutting. Efforts have been made in the past to disallow clear cutting in California. They've been shot down. Um, Forest Forever initiative in particular in 1990, which was derailed by the bombing uh, of Judy and Daryl and the blaming of them for, quote, carrying their own bomb in 1990, Judy Berry and Daryl Cherney. Um, which was fallacious, and they ended up suing the FBI and Oakland police and winning $4.4 million. But of course, right, everyone knew it was a lie. And But that was used against the Forest Forever initiative in 1990. And so we have seen these extreme efforts to disallow any real uh, reform of forestry in California. And um, where activists go with this it's hard to understand. I mean, that's why we took to the trees in the 1980s. We actually camped in trees and we put ourselves in harm's way because we had nothing else. We didn't have the state. We couldn't afford the courts. Eventually, Environmental Protection Information Center, uh, EPIC, and then later Sierra Club sued. But again, on individual plans, 
you can't sue on a collection of plans, even though you'd think CEQA would allow it. Violence has always been a part of this. Yes, violence against the forest and violence against anyone who would try to protect it. Um, we uh, suffered extreme uh, violence and threats thereof. I, I was assaulted twice uh, and received numerous death threats. Uh, Daryl and Judy had their car rammed by a logging truck, and um, there were little kids in the car. Um, and uh, David Gypsy Chain in 1998 uh, was killed in uh, Max Am held Redwoods, Pacific Lumber, uh, when a logger, an angry logger who had threatened to drop a tree on them, did. Uh, the uh, None of these uh, incidents were even investigated. There were no arrests made by anyone. The district attorney's offices did not investigate. Uh, there was an impunity in the 1980s and 90s against Redwood activists. And that allowed, again, for timber companies to continue their assault on the Redwoods and then for uh, others to continue their assault on us. And the, of course, nadir of this entire cycle was the bombing in 1990 in Oakland of Judy and Daryl. Uh, and then an immediate attempted frame up by the FBI and the Oakland police uh, for that uh, incident that almost would have killed Judy had the bomb gone off her correctly. It did seriously injure her, uh, maim her for life. Uh, and, you know, uh, we in other countries, uh, none of us would have lasted very long at all. Uh, but the fact that there was this attempted assassination att uh, of Judy in particular, because she not only was a Redwood activist, she was a labor organizer, a double threat. Uh, really speaks to the desperation of getting this cut out in the, in the woods, uh, how lucrative that is and how important it is continuously for the growth of other, other industries. What do we know today about that assassination attempt against Judy Berry? Well, we don't yet know who the exact bomber was. There was never a real investigation by Oakland police or the FBI. Um, and it came out in court, uh, and everyone knew prior to that who were close to the situation, that um, there were many uh, falsifications of evidence in support of framing them, um, that, you know, and this whole process really disallowed a real investigation. Um, so what do we know now about that? Uh, we know the type of bomb that was used. We know where it was placed. Uh, and there are people probably involved with that who, um, you know, they're, they're known. Uh, but, you know, to, you know, in, in the end, Dennis Cunningham, the, the famed civil rights attorney, uh, who was the lead attorney uh, on the successful case in federal court uh, in San Francisco against um, the FBI and Oakland police, um, he rather surprised me, and I include this in the book, uh, by giving a speech uh, in honor of Judy up in Humboldt County some years later after the verdict came in, um, where he said, you know, like a lot of incidents in the past, Black Panthers, American Indian Movement, uh, this assassination attempt was directed by the FBI itself, you know, in collusion with the Oakland police. Uh, and he laid that out very carefully in court. That wasn't the accusation in court, but he said it afterward. And that surprised me. Um, Dennis Cunningham was a very, he's passed now, but he was a very careful attorney. And he said that the evidence uh, led only to that conclusion. And, and, you know, at the behest of the timber industry and that timber was directly involved. And so, you know, that, I think we all kind of, believed this at the time, but to have it verified by one of the nation's most important civil rights attorneys, or at least to have it uttered, um, was again surprising. Well, uh, and yet there's been no no action by Congress, no investigation of the FBI in this particular incident, uh, and there should be. And all the files need to be turned over. Uh, there are many files that have not been turned over. Uh, and um, it should be brought out into the open. What happened here? There's never been a bomber found. Why has there not been an active investigation still to this day by 
city, state, or federal authorities. No investigation, a real investigation has ever occurred. And that's appalling to me. Do you have a sense of what the motivation of the FBI to be involved in this would be? I think the FBI has always needed bogeymen uh, to justify their existence. And this is one, what you call maybe call branch of the FBI. You know, it's, it's not, again, all black and white uh, at the FBI or anywhere. Yeah. Uh, we see FBI, you know, uh, cracking down on, on uh, uh, traffickers, on, um, you know, truly rogue um, corporate operations, um, you know, finding kidnapped people, uh, you know, taking real chances in in um, doing, you know, important law enforcement work that exists in this country. There's no denying that there are issues and there are incidents of violence, of theft um, that need to be addressed. And there are uh, this other these other branches of the FBI that do that quite well. And, and I'm the first to admit it. But there's this other kind of J. Edgar Hoover hangover that um, is a political operation against perceived enemies of the corporate industrial military state. And uh, we, the Earth Firsters, who were working in the 1980s, in particular, the most prominent of the national group, um, you know, I, I don't want to overstate it because what what other groups went through, but we were kind of the next thing. Um, you know, there were the Black Panthers, the American Indian Movement, the communists uh, that, the you know, and and many of those individuals in those groups suffered far more than we did. I won't with the exception of Judy Berry, who truly suffered. Um, so, I, again, I don't want to overstate that. But we were kind of the next thing in that J. Edgar Hoover-esque uh, attack mode. And so in support of the timber industry uh, and, and in support of cracking down on, uh, you know, constitutionally protected direct action, in, in any case, um, you know, all, you know a ma on a macro level, uh, Earth First was the thing that they went after in the 1980s. Uh, and so, but getting, drilling down more into the specifics, I mentioned the 1990, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, initiative, the Forest Forever Initiative, which would have changed logging in California. It would have required, first of all, the purchase of Headwaters Forest at a, at a price not exorbitant, uh, Max Ham and Charles Hurwitz eventually got $480 million for that grove, which was more than half of the 1985 purchase price of the entire Pacific Lumber Company. So that was forestalled, that that actual, you know, true market value purchase. Uh, but more importantly, uh, Forest Forever would have um, disallowed all logging except selective cutting in the state. And at that point, the major timber companies, Georgia Pacific, Louisiana Pacific, uh, Maxam slash Pacific Lumber uh, were busy clear cutting their inventories as fast as possible. So it was important to link these earth firsters who had, quote, bombed themselves with the creation and promotion of that initiative. And uh, Dennis Cunningham talks about this. A lot of analysts have talked about this, that that was among the primary reasons. So there was the crackdown on Earth First movement like there was a crackdown on progressive movements throughout this country's history by the FBI. And there was the need to forestall the Forest Forever Initiative, which was polling heavily to win and then lost by under three points uh, when, in 1990. Regrettably, we're out of time. We, we could have spent an entire hour just on this topic, and, and maybe we should have. We, we may have to invite you back to do that. But, but just quickly, has there been an effort of of a, a forest a forever like initiative since? No, there's been nothing of that um, uh, ambition and and that uh, technically uh, proficient. Uh, so it was written in large part by Robert Sutherland here in Humboldt County, who goes by the name Man Who Walks in the Woods, uh, who is a self-taught legal expert, you know, among others. And it was a very effective 
or would have been a very effective law. Uh, and we've seen nothing else like it since. And it was tragic what happened to Judy and tragic what was allowed to continue to happen to the redwood forest and other forest types but in California. This will sound cold and I don't mean it to, but it almost sounds effective. If, if oh, no, it's not cold. It was entirely effective. Um, it, you know, it shut down that initiative. Um, and we see that type of uh, power uh, rise up occasionally in history, in the Redwood struggles, but but elsewhere, uh, kind of like it's been hiding under this surface opaqueness. And then suddenly it's in your face because there's a desperation to not allow change or to force a certain other change. And so we saw that power up close and personal and it's discomforting and uh, it's destructive. And we're seeing the destructive in, in destructiveness in many uh, ways in our world today. And uh, how to deal with that is, is a question that I simply can't answer. <laughs> Greg King has been our guest. Again, Greg King is a lifelong forest activist, also a journalist, and he's the author of the book that he has joined us to talk about. It's called The Ghost Forest, Racist, Radicals, and Real Estate in the California Redwoods. Greg King, I thank you very much. Thank you, Mitch. It's been a real pleasure.